Hi, and thank you for watching this video. I was actually working on another video when our Heavenly Father prompted me to share this one with you first. This is something very interesting that a brother in Christ, Joshua Campbell, who commented on my previous video, pointed out, and I believe it could have very significant information in it as we watch for the return of our Lord and King Jesus Christ. In the parable of the talents that I will look at in a little more detail in the next video, we will consider the description that the unprofitable servant gives of his master, and how this is reflected in what many believers think of their Lord today, even though they may not be aware of it, and may not have given this any thought yet. In this parable, however, there is another nugget that we will consider in this video. The master of the servants is said to have gone on a journey to a far land, that took a long time, as we can see in the following two passages. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them. This is not the only parable in which a far journey is referenced. In the Gospel of Mark we have another passage that mentions a far journey that the master of the servants would take, as can be seen next. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house, and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. We also know that we are told in the word of God that everything that was written was given to us to obtain understanding, and that God spread his message to us out over his entire word. Only when we consider everything that was written in God's word are we considered wise, and can we obtain a complete understanding of this, and this is how God designed his word. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. Now what is interesting about the long journey that the master of the servants took, is that we have another reference to this from Proverbs, in which an adulteress seduces a young man, while the master of the house is away, and the young man fitting the shoes of the unprofitable servant that Jesus mentioned in the parables. Here is what the adulteress had to say. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He is gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. This passage fits in very well with the two parables that were given by Jesus. But in this one there is one additional aspect mentioned which may be inferred in the parables, but which is not specifically pointed out. That is, that the good man or the master will return on an appointed day. We know that appointed days refer to the Lord's feast days, and these are clearly defined for us in his word, or so most may think. There is actually one appointed day or feast of the Lord that is somewhat obscured, but which also forms part of our Heavenly Father's instructions to his people, and this instruction is given in Numbers chapter 9. Firstly, the Lord instructs Moses to keep the Passover at its appointed time. This instruction is not only given in this passage, but several times throughout the books of Moses. However, in the ninth chapter of Numbers, there is an interesting situation that occurs for which Moses goes to God to ask him for his instructions. Please consider the passage that is given in this regard. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man, that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day, and those men said unto him, We are defiled by the dead body of a man. Wherefore are we kept back, that we may not offer an offering of the Lord in his appointing season among the children of Israel? And Moses said unto them, Stand still, and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. As you can see, certain men had to deal with a dead body at the time of Passover, which in itself would point to the situation in which Jesus died for the sins of the world during this feast of the Lord. 
So as these people were defiled by a dead body and could not keep Passover, they asked Moses what they should do, and Moses in turn asked the Lord for his instructions. Now notice our Heavenly Father's response to this question, and consider an additional condition that our Heavenly Father adds to his instruction, which those who inquire did not ask about. This is very important to take note of, because this is something that receives a lot of attention in the New Testament, when Jesus speaks to his people in parables, and something that would seem to connect this hidden feast to his return. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you, or of your posterity, shall be unclean by reason of a dead body, or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord. The fourteenth day of the second month at even, they shall keep it, and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Those who were defiled did not ask Moses what to do in a situation where a person had been on a long journey to a far country. So why would our Heavenly Father add this condition to keeping Passover at a later time? Think about that for a minute. We know from the parables that Jesus shared, and the description we have in Proverbs, that this is pointing to Jesus who is the good man who will return from a far country while he was on a long journey, and from Proverbs we are told that this will happen on an appointed day, or a feast day. Could it be that this instructions in Numbers 9 is showing us the appointed time on which the bridegroom will arrive? The fourteenth day of the second month occurs on a full moon, one month after Passover is kept. This is also three days before a date given to us in Genesis when God caused the rain to be on the earth for forty days and forty nights. If you watched my previous four videos, you will remember the repeating patterns that we discussed that involves three days of darkness that is followed by forty days of rain being poured out over the world, which will prepare the next portion of God's harvest for receiving a second fulfillment of Pentecost. I am just amazed at how our Heavenly Father is able to use a repeating pattern in so many instances, and that a somewhat hidden feast of the Lord would fit in perfectly with the timeline shown to us in what happened when Jesus was crucified, buried for three days, followed by forty days of preparing believers to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This matches the same pattern of Jonah who spent three days in the belly of the fish, and then proclaimed forty days over Nineveh, before judgment would start if they failed to repent. The same pattern could once again be repeated on this upcoming instance of second Passover, given the situation that the world finds itself in. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And it will also fit in with the parable of the ten virgins, in which Jesus tells us that the bridegroom tarried. And we already know from the other parables the reason why he tarried. He was on a long journey, which would then invoke the instructions given in Numbers chapter 9. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. The fact that the bridegroom tarried and that he did not arrive at the expected time would then fit in with the understanding that he would have had to wait another month to keep Passover because of the journey that he was on. This could mean then that the virgins expected his arrival on Passover. But since he was on a long journey to a far country, the appointed time for Passover in this situation would be one month later on the fourteenth day of the second month. And this is why we are told that the bridegroom tarried. This understanding would seem to become very clear when we combine what is written in the parables with Numbers chapter 9 and Proverbs chapter 7, and points to the appointed day on which the good man returns from a far journey that took a long time. On the Hebrew and Torah calendar, the day on which second Passover is celebrated begins in the evening of April 26th this year, and whether this calendar is the right one to use, we do not know. It could also apply to the Enoch calendar, which may position this time another month further into the future. Whatever the case may be, it could be an important day to keep our eyes on, as far as expecting the return of our bridegroom is concerned. Once again, I am not saying that we know with 100% certainty that Jesus will come back for us on this day. We are watching and looking at possibilities. 
God works in patterns and it may also apply to some future instance related to Israel's harvest that may only occur during the millennial reign of Christ, or it could apply to both instances. I am saying that God's word would seem to connect this date to references of Jesus who describes himself as having gone on a long journey. And second Passover, which was given by our Heavenly Father, specifically for situations in which a person had been on a long journey, would seem to apply perfectly to Jesus' return for his bride. Even though this feast may be somewhat obscured among the other feast days, it is our Heavenly Father that set this as an appointed day that is associated with very specific conditions. Well, that is all I have for you in this short update. I hope this has blessed you as it did me, and I am certainly looking forward to seeing what could possibly happen during this time which is almost upon us. The Bible says that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you will receive salvation. Have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you placed all of your trust in Him to save you from your sins? Jesus shed His precious blood on the cross to set you free from sin, and your sins being washed away and you becoming a fellow heir with Christ as a son or daughter of God is a free gift to anyone who will accept. The only way in which you can obtain this gift is through faith. You cannot earn it, and you cannot pay God back for it once you have it. Would you not accept His gift of eternal life to you today, while there is still time to do so? Do not trust in your own works to save you, even if those works are the works that you do under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus will receive all the glory for every person that He saved, and we can only offer Him our gratitude and worship. Jesus' suffering on the cross is a picture difficult to understand. He was betrayed by a friend, arrested and falsely sentenced to death. He was beaten and whipped, a crown made of thorns pressed into his head. Bearing the cross, he stumbled and staggered up the hill to Golgotha. Each step of the journey getting worse, spit on, cursed, and mocked. But Jesus never looked back. He kept going. Jesus could have avoided the cross, called down fire from heaven, or summoned legions of angels to rescue him, to save him. But Jesus was not interested in saving himself. He was all about saving you. Every detail of this torturous path to the cross was part of God's plan to bring you to him. We're all broken. We've all messed up and have all made wrong choices. And no one had to teach us as a baby about anger and selfishness. We just came out that way, sort of a sin covering. But on the cross, with his blood he shed, the Bible says Jesus blotted out our record of sin, nailing it to his cross. The blood of Jesus washes away our sin covering and his blood is our ticket our ticket to enter through a new door a forever relationship door with God so what do we do with this great news the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved you see, it's not enough to believe in Jesus with just your head. You must believe with your heart. Now, there's just one person alone at the foot of the cross. It is you. What will you say to Jesus? Say, thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for me. I'm giving you my heart today, Jesus. I do believe you died for me and that you were raised from the dead for me. Please give me a new heart and a new life right now. God hears you and he is answering your prayer. The love of God is being poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. 